Hello, my name is Jamie Walko. I've worked in special education in Delaware since 1979. I currently consult with Department of Education. Over the years, I've worked closely with physicians for referrals, evaluation, and to gain medical documentation regarding a child's diagnosis. At this time, I would like to provide background information to assist you in understanding the guidelines, rules, and regulations that we must follow during the Individualized Education Program, or IEP, process under the federal law called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. Today, I will discuss the following topics the child find activities and how to refer a child for evaluation, the steps to an IEP, your part in the IEP process, and last, how the IEP team determines eligibility and related services. The National Early Childhood Technical Assistance Program has identified the overarching goal of preschool special education as enabling young children to be active and successful participants in home, school, and community settings, resulting in positive outcomes for children and their families. It is not just about the child. It also includes assisting families and caretakers in helping children to learn. This slide notes the steps to an IEP, which begins with child find activities. Child find activities are a way to reach out to the community to identify children who may be in need of further evaluation. It may begin with developmental screening, which, occur, which might lead to a referral for evaluation. After receiving the referral, an evaluation occurs, followed by an eligibility meeting and development of an IEP. We will talk about this process in more detail in the next few slides. One child find activity is developmental screening. Developmental screenings are an important tool used to monitor a child's development. Last legislative session, House Bill 202 was passed, mandating all licensed child cares provide developmental screening to all children, unless they are already identified with special ed services. Delaware is using the Ages and Stages questionnaire, the ASQ3, which looks at the child's overall development and the Ages and Stages social and emotional screening, the ASQSE2, which looks at the child's ability to interact with others as their developmental screening tools. Families must complete both screenings. The Department of Education has set up a system to review the screenings and contact families with results. If there is a concern, the family is contacted to review the screening and discuss follow-up. If the family is in agreement, a child is referred to the appropriate agency for evaluation. The American Academy of Pediatrics has a recommended schedule for screening of 9, 18, 24, or 30 months. This slide provides information regarding to whom referrals should be made. Please remember, if you have a concern about a child's development with or without screening, please make a referral. Any person involved with that child may make a referral with parent permission. Referrals for children more than 45 days from their third birthday go to Child Development Watch, or CDW. This is based on where the child resides, either Newcastle County or Kent and Sussex County. Referrals for children 45 days or less from their third birthday should be made to school districts. In Kent and Sussex counties, referrals are made to the district based on where the child resides. Newcastle County referrals are based on where the child attends child care. They have a memorandum of understanding which permits children to receive services based on the location of their child care. This alleviates problems providing services in the child care and transporting children to a school program. Anyone can make a referral as long as the parent is in agreement. Please be aware of the importance of the parent's knowledge and agreement to the referral. No action can be taken without the parent providing permission for evaluation. If a parent is contacted without the knowledge that a referral was made, it can create a negative interaction. It's best to start our relationship with the family on a positive note. This is a screenshot of the school district locator link to assist in determining which school district the child resides and the contacts for referrals and follow-up. Feel free to stop the webinar to get information that you may need. This slide represents a special education timeline. The evaluation must be conducted at an eligibility meeting held within 45 days or 90 calendar days, whichever is less, of receiving the parental consent to evaluate. The IEP must be written within 30 days after determining eligibility and is reviewed annually. After referral, 
evaluation is completed. What exactly is an evaluation for special education services? This is taken directly from the regulations. The IEP team and other qualified professionals as appropriate shall review existing evaluation data. This includes evaluations, information provided by parents, current classroom-based observations, observations by teachers and related services. Based on the review of data and parent input, the team determines if further information is needed. If all necessary information is present, the team will decide whether a child is a child with a disability who requires special education and the child's strengths and educational needs. Parent consent is a crucial part of the process. No evaluations can occur without this consent. The regulations continue to note the IEP team may not use a single measure or assessment as a sole criteria for determining if a child is a child with a disability or for determining an appropriate education program. The IEP team will review this information and document the discussion in the evaluation summary report or ESR. The law clearly states that no one person makes any decisions regarding the child's eligibility or services to be provided through their IEP. This is an IEP team decision. This is a screenshot of an evaluation summary report. The IEP team documents its discussion on this document. Each participant signs off as to their agreement or dissent with the eligibility determination. Here you can see who must participate in the IEP meeting. The school district is responsible for scheduling this meeting. Once again, this is part of federal regulations. The IEP team must consist of the student's parents, guardians, a student if they're 14 years or older, at least one of the child's general education teachers. If a child attends a child care, their provider can participate as the general education teacher. However, the child's special education teacher is often duly certified in special and regular education and usually attends as the regular education teacher. At least one special education teacher, a specialist who can interpret the evaluations of results, a district representative with authority over special education services, and the parents may also invite participants. This is a list of the educational classifications used within Delaware. I want to note that different classifications begin at different ages. For example, children identified as having autism, deaf blindness, hearing impaired, and visually impaired are considered birth mandate classifications. This means they are eligible to receive services through the school district at birth. This slide focuses on early childhood education. While the IEP team is developing this document, they must remember services should strengthen the family and caregivers capacity to use multiple routines and activities as learning opportunities. Successful participation equals learning and practice equals mastery of skills. The more practice a child has, the faster they develop skills. Services should also have help families and caregivers address challenging activities by improving the child's skills and making adaptations so that he or she can be more successful. <clears throat> After the child is determined eligible for special education services, the IEP team is responsible to hold a thorough analysis of how the student is currently performing in school, develop the student's educational goals, determine a list of services the child will receive, including how often and how long, determine any accommodations, supports, and services needed for the child to be successful in the general education curriculum, and the extent to which an eligible child will be included in the regular ed environment. Does a medical diagnosis qualify a child for special education services? The regulations note, to qualify for special education services, a child who has been diagnosed with a medical disability must also be found as a child eligible as a child with a disability as defined by the Individuals with Disability Education Act or IDEA. To put it simply, a medical diagnosis does not always qualify as an educational disability under the law. Whether a child has a qualifying educational disability under the IDEA is a decision determined by the IEP team of professionals at the child's school, including the parents. <clears throat> Only after the school has comprehensively evaluated the child to determine whether the child's disabilities give rise to educational needs. At times, parents come into meetings with prescriptions for specific therapeutic interventions, which may not be warranted based on IDEA. When this occurs, it could set up the potential for increased tensions with the IEP team. 
Educators have specific guidelines that you may not be aware of prior to this presentation. We look forward to working with you and making this a collaborative process. Several classifications do require a medical diagnosis as part of their eligibility criteria. They include orthopedically impaired, deaf blind, visually impaired, other health impairment, and hearing impaired. Note this does not include autism. A child does not require a medical diagnosis to be identified as autistic. They do, however, require a special education assessment to determine they meet eligibility requirements of an educational classification of autism. There may be cases where a child may receive a medical diagnosis of autism and may not meet the eligibility criteria of an educational autism classification. I'm going to go through the disabilities that require a medical diagnosis very quickly, but feel free to stop this webinar to read the details of the classifications. Children who are eligible for special ed as a child with an orthopedic impairment include those children with skeletal deformities, disease, or neuromuscular disabilities. Children identified with other health impairment have a chronic or acute health condition. Deaf-blind children have a documented hearing or vision impairment. Children identified with a hearing impairment have a hearing loss. Children identified as visually impaired have a vision loss, including blindness. The overarching takeaway from these classifications is that they require a medical diagnosis, which adversely affects the child's educational performance. Here are the links to review the special education resources and data. In summary, Children's development should be monitored and a referral should be made for evaluation if there's a concern. If referred for evaluation, an IEP team will review background information, medical reports, evaluations, and observations to determine if the child meets criteria to be identified as a special education student based on state and federal regulations. No one piece of information can be used to determine if a child is eligible for special education services. A child who has a medical diagnosis must also be found eligible as a child with a disability as defined by IDEA. If a child is eligible, the IEP team, including the family, will determine the strengths, needs, and services needed and where the services will be delivered. Thank you for your time, and I hope this helped you to understand the IEP process.